Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's session of the Education Helpline brought to you by the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium based here in Charleston, South Carolina. If you're just joining us, um, this is our sixth week of uh, bringing you some easy activities that you can do from the comfort of your own home with just a few different, just a few easy supplies um, that shouldn't require you going out to the store or um, spending a bunch of money. Uh, but these activities are designed to not only teach about our ocean and coastal resources, but also be fun and engaging uh, for your family during um, these very, very strange times we're in right now. So um, if you've never joined us before, uh, this is a real easy um, participation from, from your side. Um, if you join us, please use the chat box to say hello and where you're from. Um, Kristen Gehring, our marine educator, is standing by manning the comment box. Um, so she's going to be posting some fun resources and links throughout the next 30 to 45 minutes uh, based on what we're talking about today. And she's also on standby to answer any questions that you have about not only the concept that we're going over today, but also um, the activity that we're doing. So please feel free to um, connect with us. Uh, this is definitely a different way of doing business than we're used to, but um, we're, um, we hope to see all of you virtually um, in the next, uh, during the session. So if you happen to need to leave early or you come in a little bit late and want to see the whole session, you can see this session and any of our previous sessions by visiting our Sea Grant Facebook page and going to the video section. You'll see all of our archived videos there and you can watch them to your heart's delight. All of the activities we're doing today are going to be posted on our Sea Grant website and Kristen will probably be posting that um, throughout the session today um, just to route you to where all of these resources will be available to you um, if you'd like to access them after um, today's session. So um, my name is Evie Bell and I'm the Marine Education Specialist with the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium and thank you for joining us. And without further ado, we're going to get started on this week's topic. So for the past few weeks, we have been focused on the ocean literacy essential principles. There are seven overarching themes that uh, are designed to teach people how, to, how they are connected to the coast and the ocean, and also how the ocean directly impacts their lives, no matter where you live. Um, one, the first principle that we went over was that the earth was, had one ocean. And if you joined in on that session, um, we did an activity that really showed that we live on an ocean dominated planet. So, um, so it makes sense that we take time to understand how we're connected um, to, to the ocean and how the ocean um, impacts our lives. So um, we're now going to be talking about ocean literacy essential principle number five. And although they're all really, really interesting and very cool, this one is exciting to me because I'm a formal, I'm, I am a biology major and love biology and ecology. So this, um, this principle, we could probably spend the next year going over all the really cool things we can talk about, but we're going to try to cram it into this week and next week um, to share with you some fun, um, fun activities and live in the field next week with Kristen. So, um, so this one, it talks about the ocean supports a great diversity of life and ecosystems. And again, that comes as no surprise because um, we are 71% water. 97% um, of that is ocean, so it makes sense that there is a tremendous amount of diversity found within, um, within our ocean. So I'm just going to kick it out in case um, you're just joining us. We're going to start off with just a quick question, quick quiz, um, kind of like how many, how many beans are in the jelly, jelly or how many jelly beans are in the jar, um, how many fish are in the ocean, um, how many species, not just fish, but how many species of organisms have been discovered to date? And the answer is 130, over 130,000 species that we know of today. Um, there was a study done, um, it was a 10-year study um, called the Census of Marine Life, and it was a 10-year study that um, 
involved 80 different nations, um, several, several hundred scientists, all tried to catalog what was known about the species that were in the ocean. And they, um, at roughly around 130, 135,000 species that we know of to date. Now, to put that in perspective, we've only explored 5% of the ocean. So 5% of the ocean we've explored and we found 130,000 different species. So the remaining 95%, that number is going to go up quite a bit. It's pretty exciting. So every year we're finding new and new and different species in our ocean um, with really cool adaptations and behaviors and things like that. So, um, so that number will continue to go up the more that we explore the ocean and study. So pretty exciting stuff. If you are interested in looking at that website, um, you can access the data for free and download. You can um, search different topics based on what you're interested in, um, but it's, it's a great resource um, that you can access. So, so let's talk really quickly before we jump into our activity here, um, but I wanted to take a second. When we talk about diversity, we can't talk about diversity without talking about classification. And if you're type A like me, you really like you really like organization and you really like grouping things based on certain characteristics. So classification does just that. Classification allows us to group organisms into based on certain characteristics, whether those are physical or um, behavioral, we can group them um, into different classifications. Now I didn't write this up, but it starts off a really, really broad and then drills down very specific. So we start off with the broad category of kingdom, then we go down to phylum, then we go to class, order, family, genus, and then species. And we, we usually talk about a species, but there's a lot more classification that goes on way up, um, way up the chain um, to, get, to get to that species level. So all the organisms that we know of are classified in some way um, to help us see similarities, links, impacts, how things have evolved over time, what my, how things might evolve over time. Um, so it's a really great way that we can catalog and categorize the things that have been discovered. And that's not just for the ocean, that's for just across, across the globe. So I'm going to focus really quickly on phylum, the category of phylum. Phyla. Um, and I wanted to just mention when we talk about diversity, um, I wrote up just a few of the different phyla that are represented in the ocean. They're more than what I've listed, but I wanted to just mention a few that um, you probably are familiar with. Um, maybe not the name, but you're probably familiar with certain organisms that belong in that phylum. So um, starting at the top there, and I'm going to sit down just because you can see everything, but starting at the top there on the list, chordata. Chordata breaks down to basically chord. And so this group captures all of the vertebrates. So those things that actually have a backbone, a spinal cord, a notochord, something like that. Um, this is the category for vertebrates. This is where we find our, I don't have a real one, but this is where we find our fish. Uh, our fish are, are um, categorized in um, the phylum chordata. Okay, so chordata um, also includes fish that we know of, bony fish like flounder, um, snapper, grouper. It also includes our cartilaginous fish that are things like stingrays and sharks. Um, so cartilaginous fish are made out of the stuff that we find in our ears, the tips of our nose, and our fingers, um, cartilage. So they're very flexible. But they all, but both categories have um, either a notochord or spinal cord and are considered vertebrates, okay? So the next, um, the next category down, echinodermata, it's a mouthful to say, but it basically breaks down into spiny skin, derm meaning skin, um, echinospiny. Um, those organisms you probably are familiar with. Um, I've got two here. One is real, one is a mold. Um, but this is um, your sand dollars. Your sand dollars belong to this group, Echinodermata. Um, and now this is smooth, but when it was living, it actually was very prickly. Um, and those are the tubed feet that help it move around. So that's why it's considered spiny skinned. The next one you know of, I'm sure, um, this is a, a sea star. I painted on it, so sorry about that. But this is um, this is a sea star. This is also part of Echinodermata spiny skin. All right. 
The next, uh, the next group is Mollusca. Um, this is a really very, very big phylum here, and this includes things that look like, they can look like snails, marine snails, so things like conchs and whelks. Um, also things like clams and oysters. They have a hard shell and a soft body. That's basically, that categorizes um, mollusca. Hard shell, soft body. But here's a really interesting thing. So I don't have a live one, but I've got an octopus here and it's close cousin the squid. These guys are actually considered to be in this same phylum. So I just said that there was a hard shell and a soft body. So how come if you touch a squid or an octopus, then you have, um, then you have, that doesn't make any sense. So you touch a squid or an octopus, they're squishy. There's no hard shell. So this is what, this is why classification is so interesting. Um, squid, for example, millions of years ago, squid actually had a hard shell around their body. And over millions of years, they developed some really cool adaptations like really fast speed, um, they can squirt ink, they've got a beak. Um, so they adapted to be able to get away from predators and also catch their prey. So that, that shell was no longer needed and it, it was internalized. So if, you're, if you cut open a squid, you can actually find the remnants of um, the squid on the inside. So that's why it's still considered to be part of the phylum mollusca. So pretty cool stuff. Um, so Cnidaria, the next one down, Cnidaria, I did not bring an example of this in for obvious reasons when I tell you what it is, but Cnidaria are um, animals that have stinging cells. And so things um, come as no surprise, jellyfish are part of this phylum. Another thing that, another organism that is part of this phylum is coral. So coral is also considered in this phylum. All these little holes right here, when this coral was alive, housed a little organism that looked like a little sea anemone, had little tentacles. And those little tentacles had stinging cells. So that's why corals are also considered to be part of this phylum. Arthropoda, arthropoda, arthro, arthro means jointed and poda means feet. So jointed feet, jointed feet. I'm not part of arthropoda, but um, when I tell you that crabs are horseshoe crabs, which is, they're not a true crab, but horseshoe crabs here. Um, these are part of this phylum. They have jointed legs, okay, including claws, the scary part. Um, and then I added this last one, um, just uh, in case you're not familiar with it, just to learn a little bit more. Um, the last one is called periphera. And periphera, um, if you look at the beginning of that word, it says pore, so it has pores in it. Um, so sponges, now this one's dried out, but sponges are considered to be part of the phylum periphera. Um, periphera, they have, if this was alive, you could see all, you can actually see the little pores now, even though it's dried out, but this is a colony of animals that's live, that are living together. It's almost like a little apartment complex here, little guys living together. Um, so periphera are your sponges and there are lots of different shapes and colors and sizes. It's a beautiful phylum. Um, so if you see sponges on the beach, you can say, hey, that's part of phylum periphera. So this is just to show you that there's a tremendous diversity, and I'm not having even finished all the phylum that are represented in the ocean, but just with these ones here, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of diversity and more to come the more we, uh, the more we discover. So um, we're going to bounce back up to that phylum chordata, and in phylum chordata, there are 20,000 species of fish both bony and cartilaginous, that have been discovered so far. 20,000 species of fish. That's, that's crazy. And there are more to come, right? Um, so phylum chordata, so these are, these are your vertebrates, and all fish um, have certain characteristics um, across the board all the same. So um, I'm only going to name a few in the interest of time, but um, one, of the, one of the main ones is that all fish are cold-blooded. Uh, we're warm-blooded. Our bodies can can regulate our temperatures up to a point. So when a when we get too cold, we're going to start to shiver. That's our body trying to generate heat. When um, it's too hot, we're going to start to sweat to get rid of some of that that additional heat. Um, for cold-blooded animals like fish, fish have to actually go to their environment to regulate um, their their temperature. 
So all fish are cold-blooded. Um, all fish uh, have a swim bladder. So if you joined us before when we talked about buoyancy, the swim bladder is what helps a fish maintain a certain buoyancy or position in the water. So if they didn't have that swim bladder, you might see some fish floating up at the top all the time or sunk down to the bottom. Um, and so this helps them um, regulate where, uh, where they are in the water column and helps them swim. So all fish also have, um, have gills. So we have lungs to breathe. Uh, fish, all fish have gills um, that we know of. We may, we may find a fish that has lungs, but um, right now all the fish that we have discovered have gills. Um, and so I'm going to stop there because I want us to get on with our, uh, the rest of our activity. But um, just to kind of give you an introduction on this phylum, and we're going to focus our activity on this phylum of chordata, focusing on fish. So our activity is um, pretty cool, and I'm going to start it in a second. I know I'm talking a lot here, but once I get going on this activity, I've got a bunch of paint behind me, so I don't want to knock it over by a lot of back and forth. But the, um, the activity we're going to do today uh, has its roots uh, back in the mid-1800s um, in Japan. Now, I don't know about you, but... I have certain family members that love to fish and love to tell their fish stories over and over again. Well, when that story is repeated, that fish tends to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's called a fish tail. If you ever heard somebody talking about a fish tail, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger each time that story takes place. So how big was that fish? Who knows? So um, back in the 1800s in Japan, fishermen actually um, devised a way to capture the size of the fish that they were catching um, so that they had an accurate record of what they were, they were catching, not only the species, but also the size. So they developed what's called giyutaku, and it's fish printing. And this was a way that they could have a physical representation of what they caught. And so all they would need would be some rice paper, some print ink, usually it was typically black, and of course a fish. Um, and a lot of times the fish was alive. And so what they would do is they would take the fish, they would paint on the fish, and then they would take the fish, and if the fish was small enough, they'd take the fish, turn it over, and press it onto the paper. If the fish was really, really big, they would take the paper, lay it on top of the fish, and get the imprint that way. The fish was then either let go if it was still alive or it was sold to market if it was a species that they um, were fishing for um, to make a living. So, um, so it has, so fish printing has its roots in a very practical way um, of capturing data and, and collecting um, not only species but also the size. So over time, uh, fish printing has become um, an art. And so it's not only a really beautiful way to capture species, but it's become a really beautiful art form um, that's been done now um, for many, many years. It's a great way to teach, and as I go into it, I'll tell you, but it's a great way to teach anatomy um, and you know the different uh, fins on a fish and what they're used for. Um, so although it's artistic, it's a great way to teach um, some science along with it. So we're gonna do some Giyotaku. Um, the 2020 style, I don't have any um, real fish on me. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to present a couple of different ways to do this activity depending on what you have. But I am going to tell you a couple things that you really do want to have before we get started. One is, if you're wondering what my fashion was today, I have on an apron. So you either want to wear clothes that you don't mind getting paint on or you want to wear an apron. Um, the next thing that you want to do, and I'm going to scoot back here. I will be standing up here in a second. But what you want here is you want an assortment of different paints. Now, I use um, fabric paint or acrylic paint works fine. If you want to do your impression on a piece of clothing, then you want to make sure you get a paint that is not going to um, rub off or wash off in the um, washing machine and bleed on your other clothes. So fabric paint or acrylic paint can work. You also want something to apply the paint on. So I have these just because I've taught this class quite a bit. Um, you don't have to have something this fancy. You can do a little roller. It's a little spongy roller, a little sponge on the, on the base of a, a wooden dowel. Um, you can use 
regular paintbrush, that's fine. You can also use a piece of a sponge. It doesn't matter. Use what you've got at your house. The next thing you want to have is something to make your impression on, okay? So you can use clothing. Typically, a lot of you'll see a lot of fish print done on, um, on clothes as, as a t-shirt. I'm using just a plain white t-shirt. You can use an old t-shirt that has writing on it. It doesn't matter. You can find a little, a little open spot and do your fish printing on um, an open spot of a t-shirt that you have you know, in your drawer. I've got hundreds of t-shirts that I could use too. Um, so you can use clothing. You can also use a, a baseball cap. Um, I've seen people do canvas bags. So you can be as creative as you want on the, on the cloth if you want to do something on, um, on cloth or, or uh, textile. So that, you can also do it on paper, and I'm going to show you how to do that later on. So if you don't, have, if you don't want to do clothes, you can do it on paper. Um, this one I did right before um, I came on here. This is on um, just a piece of paper. So you can do paper, and it turns out just, just nicely. Um, and then you actually need something to paint. So you have options on this. Now you can use a, um, a, a real fish. I've done it before with a real fish. It's, it's great. It's authentic to do it that way. Um, I do recommend that if you do have a fish that it's, it's fairly sizable. You don't want anything too, too small. So you want something, you know, about maybe about half, half a foot um, big to, um, to imprint with. Um, I found it best if you freeze the fish first and then let it come out and thaw just slightly. You don't want it fully thawed, um, but you don't want it hard and frozen because then you can't really get a good impression um, on your fabric. So you can use a real fish. So if you want to do th that way, everything I'm going to talk about will work with a real fish. You can also use a mold. So right here, I've got a mold of a fish here. Um, a lot of environmental education uh, uh, catalogs have fish printing kits that come with different species like uh, a flounder. Um, they also have sharks and squid um, and skates. Skates and rays. I showed you the sea star behind me earlier right here that I'd already painted on. So lots of different species that you can get um, for, with a kit. Um, what's great about the kit is that you can actually wash these off. So if you have a, um, you know, you paint on it and then you can, you can rinse it off and reuse it. So that's what's great about um, these molds. They also have shells. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can use a real shell as well, not, but they also have molds in case you're interested in getting molds. All right. So, um, and like I said, you can also use um, a real a real shell, and I will demonstrate this later. Um, but I've got a real shell here that I'm going to use and paint and show you how to um, to imprint a shell. So you can use what you what you've got lying around. Same principle works. The last thing that I strongly recommend. This is not um, you don't have to use this. I find that it's just through trial and error. <laughs> um, so. If you are decide, if you are going to be using a T-shirt, I recommend that you get a piece of cardboard and fit it in between the front and the back side. So fit it inside the T-shirt so that it separates the front and the back side of the T-shirt. What this does is that it helps the paint from bleeding through. So if you want it on the front side, it'll stay on the front side. It won't bleed through to the back side. The other thing that I recommend, and you can use a sponge, you can use anything that's pliable, I'm using cotton balls just to show you, you can be creative. I've bagged up some cotton balls. What this does is this adds some give. So, and this will make sense in a moment. So what I'm gonna do for my demonstration is I'm gonna be printing on a plain white t-shirt, okay? And I'm going to put the cardboard inside in between the shirt like this. And then on the side that I'm going to print on, and I'm going to print on the front side, I'm going to stick that pliable material in between. I know it's hard to see, but so when I open up the shirt, I've got the cardboard on the bottom, my pliable material on top of the cardboard, and then the side that I want to print on closest to that pliable material. What that does is that, say I want to imprint a shell with all this definition here, when I put the paint on this, it just helps me 
move it around to get all that really good definition. If it's on a hard surface, it's harder to get that definition. So you, you don't have to do this, but you get a little bit better results if you, do, if you put a little bit of pliable material underneath here. Okay, so let's get painting. All right, so what I'm going to do, and I know this is, this is a little bit tricky for me to do it this way, but I'm going to paint and hold it up and show it to you, and then I'm going to step around and show you how to press it down, okay? So I'm going to put my, my T-shirt down here on my lap, okay? And then I have chosen, since we're talking about fish printing, I'm going to choose a fish, okay? This is cartilaginous fish. This is a skate or a ray, depending on um, what species you think it is. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to paint my mold, okay? So you do not have to use one color. If you want to use multiple colors, then I recommend that you get multiple brushes or sponges so that you don't mix the colors together, okay? So I'm going to do two colors just for the in the interest of time, okay? So I this is the front, so this is where all the detail is there, and I'm going to... I'm going to, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to paint half pink and half purple. So I have my paint already set up over here, and I'm going to paint. I'm going to show you how I'm doing it, and then I'm going to go off screen just so I can do this a little bit quicker. Um, so one trick here is that less is more. You don't want to goop a bunch of paint on here because it's going to squeeze out and bleed through your fabric. Less is more. You'll still get plenty of detail um, by just putting on less is more. Make sure you get all the definition on here. Okay. So I'm doing this backwards, so I'm sorry if this is not super exciting to watch. Um, so I'm going to do this, okay? So half my side is pink. I'm in a pink and purple mood, so I'm going to paint the other side purple, and I'm just going to I'm going to use my little my little dabber here with my sponge. And again, I'm just doing this for the interest of time. So I'm just going to do the same thing. Just going to get all that definition, not use too much paint. Okay. And voila. See, pink and purple here. Okay. Now, what's left is that tail. Okay. So I'm going to do half and half again. Use up a little bit of my pink here. Paint, paint on my tail there, and do the very tip purple. And I'm going to hold it down so I can get the get the good detail here. Okay, so I am now ready to print. So I'm going to stand up and show you. Okay, you can see my fabulous apron. So I've got my t-shirt here, I've got that pliable material and my cardboard in between. So what I'm going to want to do now is very carefully, I'm going to want to make sure that I gently turn my mold over onto my shirt, making sure that I'm, you don't have to rush this. You want to get all the details, so I'm going to I'm going to gently put it down, and then I'm going to press it down, trying to get all that detail, making sure I press the tail to get all that good detail. Okay. So take your time, and that's another benefit from not using too too much. So I'm going to press it. Down. I'm going to move it around. I can hear all that those cotton balls. Moving around, I'm going to get all that good detail, press it around, and then I'm going to gently remove it, okay? I'm going to stick it off someplace. Um, I'm going to want to wash that, you know, sooner than later, but I do want to show you that this is, this is the final, this is the final design. So there's my stingray, okay? Um, now, I would, I'm going to let that dry a little bit. 
So the next thing I want to do is show you how to do this on a piece of paper, okay? So, again, you do not have you do not have to use this, okay? Your, your, um, your design will come out just fine. But I want to show you Hang with me real quick. Let me just get my piece of paper ready to go here. Um, so I'm going to do this on the, that cardboard piece here, okay? So what you want to do is you want to, so I'm going to use this shell here, okay? All right. And I'm going to use orange for this one. Actually, I'm not. I'm going to use green. <laughs> All right, I'm going to squeeze some paint out there. Get myself another brush here. And I'm going to paint on the shell here. So this is a great shell because it's got all these really great ridges, okay? So if you've got shells that are lying around your house that are in lamps or just in boxes, this is a great way to use them. Um, you can also return them to the ocean too. But if you are looking for something creative to do, you can see right there. Okay. I'm actually going to use the same paper that I did here. Okay. It's a little bit more pliable. So I'm going to put that paper on top of whatever my sponge or my cotton balls or whatever that's pliable. And I'm going to do the same thing. Okay. See if you can see here. I don't mess this up here. So I'm going to press it and then I'm going to move it around, get all that really good detail. Okay. So I can move it around. All right. All right. It didn't come out all that great, but you get the idea. <laughs> um, you can move it around and get the ridges. You can actually get some of the ridges um, by doing that. And I think if I wasn't doing it from behind, it probably would have come out a little bit better. But that's just to show you don't have to have you don't have to do this on um, on uh, cloth if you don't want to. You could do it easily on a piece of paper, newsprint, anything you've got. Easy to do, and you can use real shells, real fish, molds if you have them. You can even expand and try to do some of that, um, some of the sponges and periphera if you happen to find that on the beach. Now, if you go to the beach and you want to use real shells and real organisms, please make sure that when you pick up the organism, it's not still living. It doesn't have something inside. So either a hermit crab or the actual animal. Um, if you find sponges, sometimes they're still alive. So you want to make sure that um, what you're actually collecting to do this with um, is is not alive. Um, so just just be sure um, of that before you take it home and slather it with paint. So, um, but anyway, this is fish printing. Um, this there are lots of different uh, resources out there that you can learn more about the um, ancient way of doing this. Um, it's it's pretty cool. I think um, it started off as a practical way of capturing data, and it turned into a really beautiful artistic. Um, way of expressing um, expressing ourselves and also teaching. I did. I know we're running short of time, but I just wanted to um, just mention for those of you who are are teachers or who want to see maybe a little bit more of the connection to science with this. One thing that you can do, along with fish printing, is you can take time to talk about the role of fins on fish. Okay. Um, all fish have some type of thin sweet <laughs> on their body. They may look really, really different. Um, the flounder, for example, their fins, they, they lie flat on the bottom. So their fins look very different than, say, a grouper or a snapper. So you can take time and actually teach about fish anatomy um, by with the fish printing. So you can talk about the function of this caudal or this tail fin, which provides propulsion, movement forward. Um, you can talk about the dorsal fin. Um, um, you can talk about the pectoral fin. The pectoral fin provides balance for um, and stability for a fish. Um, the dorsal fin um, is that 
that back on the, on the back side of the of the fish um, that also helps provide stability um, for uh, for fish. So you can talk about the functions of the different um, fins. You can also talk about really interesting adaptations. Some some um, some fish, like the flying fish, they have really, really big pectoral fins, and that allows them to jump out of the water and go really far distances. So you can talk about different adaptations of fins. Um, you can get your students to research different spe uh, fish species. Um, that's really fun to really make this rubber mold mean a little bit more uh, if you research actual fish that live um, in the ocean and even in your area, um, especially if you live on the coast. It's good to know what our uh, local species are here. Um, so those are just some, some easy extensions that you can do um, for your science classroom and also tie in some art as well with that. So um, with that, I think I'm a little over 30 minutes. Um, there's so much more I could talk about. I love this subject, but um, I will pause here and then see if there are any questions from the audience or uh, about content or what we just did with fish printing. So I will scroll down here. Um, so, it, okay, thank you. Yes, Kristen posted how um, how to spell Gyotaku. So thank you for posting that. Yes, I can. I sometimes stumble over how it's um, pronounced. So, um, yep, Gyotaku. Um, Thanks for posting that, and um, and we'll also be posting the materials and um, procedure in case you want to know how to um, do this entire um, project. We'll be posting this on our website so you can see um, how um, how I did it today, and you can make your own adaptations based on what you what you want and what you need. So let's see. I think we may have a couple of additional questions, um, and. So, so yes. So the thirteen, the the question is, does the one hundred and thirty thousand species um, include things like bacteria and other tiny organisms? And the answer is yes. Um, it doesn't just. Um, it's a, it's a census of all marine species. So any um, any species that was found, um, it does include um, some of those smaller things, even uh, plankton, zooplankton, phytoplankton, things like that. Great question. Um, and then the rubber, um, the rubber molds. So there are several companies out there that um, are environmental or naturalist um, for either environmental education or science education or naturalist education. If you go to any of those general, just type in any of those search words, um, you'll find some vendors that actually have um, fish printing kits, um, and it, it comes with the paints and the molds. Everything like that, and they're and they're really reasonable. And you really the only thing that you have to um, replace would be the paints. Um, a lot of these molds uh, you can you can wash off um, easily and use them from year to year to year. So, I um, mean, even if the paint dries on these molds, you can still use them. Um, it's you're never going to get them sparkling clean, but they will um, they will uh, still be able to be used. So. Great question. So yeah, there are lots of lots of different um, vendors out there that um, sell kits or the individual molds, depending on what you want. Great question. All right. Well, um, I think that is um, that is all for me today. Join us next week. We're going to change things up next week. Next Thursday, we are going to be trying out our fancy new. Um, iPhone tripod, and Kristen is going to be uh, shooting live from the salt marsh next week, showing you live in a person critters and plants that um, are along our coastline. So weather permitting, we will be out in the field next week. So please join us next Thursday, same time. Um, and thank you for joining. Please let us know if we can help you. Um, with anything right now, um, and uh, we will hopefully see you next week. Bye, y'all.